Welcome to the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution and Civic Responsibility, an ongoing inquiry into the origins and evolution of American government. The Executive Director of the Virtual Center is Dr. Bill O'Brien. He's also the host of this discussion. And here he is, Dr. Bill O'Brien. Thank you, Agnes, and welcome to this Tuesday edition of the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution and Civic Responsibility. Today is Tuesday. It is the 29th day of November in the year 2016. We have one more day of this month, and then we move into Christmas month, into December. Uh, it's very, very hard to believe, and of course, the weather here is not giving us any help. Because the temperature today here is in the 60s, in the low 60s. Sun is shining. We're in the we're in in line for some rain. It rained this morning. Started in the middle of the night. Rained into this morning. Then the sun has come out. It's been out for three or four hours now. Temperature's gone up over 60. But um, word is that we are going. We are in for some rain later today and tonight and into tomorrow. So, and we need it. And I think. Uh, the fact that I just I hadn't really heard this, but uh, the fact that Gatlinburg, Tennessee, has is on fire and and a, a huge portion of the city has been damaged uh, seems to make it very clear as to why uh, we really need to keep really need to keep the rain and get as much rain as we as we can. I hope that everybody is doing well and I hope that everybody had a wonderful, wonderful Thanksgiving. Um, I do apologize for not having a live program yesterday. That was totally my doing. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit uh, once we get through the uh, the introductory information, but uh, I, I haven't had a chance until now to uh, express my wishes that everybody, I hope, had a wonderful, wonderful Thanksgiving. And when you think about it, it's a, it's kind of a beautiful holiday. Um, not only that is it uh, graced with some of the best food in the world, and I think there's something about Thanksgiving dinner. If you go for the better part of the year without having it, it is just about the most delectable thing in the world. And and uh, we were very fortunate. We had dinner with friends and and uh, were able to uh, enjoy the traditional fixings, and it was it was just wonderful. And everybody I've talked to since then has had a, has had a wonderful day as as well. And it's kind of interesting. I uh, just returned. It came uh, before we came on the air. Of course, I attended our local Rotary meeting, and they were reminding us that Friday was Black Friday, and Monday was Cyber Monday, and today is Giving Tuesday. So. Um, I, I, you know, they wanted us to kind of keep in mind that it's not always take, 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 but in essence, there's an opportunity to give back as well. I, I was sitting at the table and I, I listened to this and I was thinking of Jefferson all, you know, and, uh, and his idea what, what happiness is. And, and, uh, I think there's something to that and, uh, something very, very meaningful to that. So anyway, I hope that everybody did have a wonderful, wonderful Thanksgiving, and, and uh, it is a pleasure to be with you on this gorgeous day here in Appalachia, and I hope your day is going well as well. Um, we have had, as many of you have probably heard, an airline tragedy today. Um, a, tra a plane crashed in, in uh, Brazil, I believe, and uh, most, of the, most of the Brazilian soccer team was, was killed in the crash, 76 uh, passengers were, well, as people were killed in the crash. Six survived. Three of them were members of the soccer team. So um, it's a it's a disaster. Uh, every every crash like that is a disaster. But I think those who follow international athletics uh, will agree that, uh, of course, here in West Virginia, we still uh, think back to 1970 when the Marshall football team was was uh, wiped out in a in a horrendous plane, plane plane crash and it took Marshall a number of years to get back and I know that the Brazilian folks will that po folks in Brazil will get back too but it's just an awful tragedy um, I do encourage you to call and in fact at the beginning of the program today I'm going to suggest uh, mention a couple of things and for that I do solicit your calls uh, we have a phone number the number is area code 304-663 Four six seven six, three zero four six six three, four six seven six. 
my email address if you'd like to communicate with me that way. I would love to hear from you. I'll do the very, very best I can to get your thoughts, your ideas, your concerns on the year if you're not uh, comfortable uh, doing so yourself. Uh, my email address is waobrien906 at gmail.com. That's waobrien, O-B-R-I-E-N, lowercase, all one word, 906 at gmail.com. Let me give it one more time from beginning to end so that uh, folks won't be confused. It is waobrien906 at gmail.com. Dot com. It's all lowercase, all one word in the first half. Uh, and I do encourage you to avail yourself of that email. I, I use email quite a bit. I know that Twitter is becoming the, uh, is the vogue uh, the, of the day, so to speak. In fact, I've got a few uh, pieces of literature that I've been looking at related to that and to Donald Trump, of course, um, that uh, if we have time, I'll, I'll uh, mention later. But but uh, I do uh, encourage uh, you to take advantage of the email address if you're at all reluctant to get on the air. But I encourage you uh, to get on the air and feel comfortable doing it. Finally, we do have our Facebook page, and we've had it for a number of months now. And uh, I haven't put anything on it for the last couple of days. But over the weekend, I put three or four pieces uh, on the Facebook page postings uh, for your uh, for your reaction, and uh, in fact, I, I'll I'll mention uh, one of them in a moment, and uh, uh, one of the last ones that I put on. Um, but again, if you are a user of Facebook, it's very very simple. Just go to the home page for Facebook, and at the top there is a search box. And if you type in the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution, you will be into our Facebook page. And the most recent postings uh, that I've been able to put on there uh, will come for will be there first. Uh, and you can take a look at them. And there's a place there that you can comment, that you can share, um, or if you'd like uh, to make a more substantive comment, you can feel free to drop me an e line an email at waobrien906 at gmail.com, or better yet, you can pick up the phone and call our number at area code 304-663-4676. I mentioned that uh, uh, I was going to open the program today with a, a solicitation for calls for input from you. And so let me tell you uh, basically what my uh, what, what what I have in mind. Um, Part of the reason that I was not able to do a program live yesterday was very well. First of all, um, we had you know had a wonderful Thanksgiving weekend, as I'm sure everybody else did. But like at many like many of us, uh, it was it was a bit traumatic. We were running around from place to place, and we had grandchildren, and we were delivering them to their parents and all of that. And uh, it got to be a little bit hectic. And um, so after the weekend, I started to, uh, uh, as I frequently often do, uh, go to the Internet, look at the Internet, catch up on my reading, as it were. And I began to print off pieces uh, for potential issues uh, that we might deal with here at the Virtual Center. And I probably ran off eight to ten different uh, items that I thought would be worthy of, uh, of putting on our uh, dressing on our program here at the Virtual Center. And then yesterday morning, when I sat down to put the program together, um, and again, it usually ta it's usually about 9 a.m., 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning. When I get to that, after I finish my, my chores, walk the dog, et cetera, et cetera, um, that gives me about three and a half to four hours uh, each day to put the program together. And for some reason yesterday, it just wasn't coming together. Um, I had three or four false starts, and I kept saying, well, I'll begin with this, and then I'll go here, and that didn't seem to ring true, and I was beginning to panic, um, and when it got to be close to about 11 a.m. Eastern time, um, with, when we got within two hours of the start of the program, I became very nervous and very stressed, and I said, my God, I'm, nothing's coming together today. I don't know what I'm going to do. And uh, so finally, I called Agnes and I said, Agnes, can we back off? I'm, 
<laughs> I'm in the midst of a stress attack here uh, over the program, and I don't want to do that. And I don't want to go on the air, and I don't want to blow it. I don't want to embarrass Bob or you or the Head On Network or myself or anybody else. So I thought the best thing to do is just back off and let yesterday's live program go. And then the more I thought about it, and I was having, I was chatting with my wife yesterday afternoon about this very issue. And she made the point, which she has made numerous times before, I will say, and I've kind of um, not taken these that seriously. I've kind of, uh, uh, you know, blown, but not blown them off necessarily. I listened to them, but at the same time, it's not something that I really wanted to do that much. So I, I, I you know, kind of thanked her for the for the suggestion, but then I didn't act on it. And yesterday the suggestion came back and she said, you need to realize that four hours of preparation each of three days in a row, plus the time that you're on the air, is a significant block of time when you think about it. And especially if in the interim, after it's over in the late afternoon and early evening, you're posting things on Facebook and you're checking uh, to see some of the major stories and major issues. And um, so, you know, I, I, I regularly probably look at five or six sites, Internet sites that I regularly look at. Boston Globe, New York Times, Washington Post. Um, Chicago Sun Times, L.A. Times, um, The Nation, um, Washington Times, which is a conservative paper. I try to make sure I, I look at I look at that as as well, and uh, and then occasionally I do others. Uh, there's a website, a, a liberal website, website called Crooks and Liars that I look at frequently. Another one called Truthout.org. I think I've mentioned that more than once here at the Virtual Center, along with the nation and several other uh, places that I go. Of late, I've been looking rather seriously at the New Yorker because with the uh, election just ending a couple of weeks ago, uh, the New Yorker has, has printed some absolutely fabulous, insightful pieces on the election and the implications of a Trump presidency and the issues related to the transition and all the rest of it. And I found them, for, as you know, the New Yorker has some of the best writing uh, that we can find anywhere. So I've been all over the, the New Yorker for the last month, I guess I would say. And then uh, yesterday, uh, I got into the New York Review of Books, and that's one that I've um, that I keep coming back to over and over again. The, the, the book reviews on the New York Review of Book are, are spectacular. Um, for num numerous times over the years, I've been a subscriber for the hard copy. Uh, but I do go on the Internet frequently and look at them, and I found several pieces on the New York Review uh, that I was very, very interested in. But the fact of the matter is the, the the stress factor of putting of putting a live program on for each day for two hours uh, that we're on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Uh, it, it is indeed a stressor, and part of the issues, and this was conversation uh, with with my wife as I mentioned, part of the issues is for me is the two hour length of the program. Um, that coupled with the fact that and, and again, I, I, I know that, you know, that, for example, last Wednesday, Horst called, uh, as he has done on a couple of Wednesdays. Uh, and we've been very fortunate to have extended conversations with him in our second hour on a couple of consecutive Wednesdays. But the fact of the matter is we don't get that many calls. And so what that means is that for, you know, the reality is that. Each day, I'm looking at a two-hour presentation, and I'm soliciting calls, and I give the phone number every day, but the fact of the matter is we don't get that many, and there's a number, there are a number of reasons for that, and, and there could be a lot of others that I don't know, but the ones I do know, um, one of the major ones is that an awful lot of our listeners 
listen to the program on podcast, on the archives. In other words, they aren't here live. I don't really know what kind of a what kind of an audience, live audience we even have. I know that there are people out there because I get emails all the time, but in terms of, of, of how many, I have no idea. Um, but I also know that we don't get, if there are people out there, we don't get many calls. And I've received a number of emails from people saying that the reason they don't call is because they listen. A couple of folks have said they take notes um, and they, they don't want to interrupt the train of thought or they don't want to stop me in the middle of something. And so for a number of different reasons, and many, many of them are positive, they're not all negative by any means. Um, but the fact of the matter is we don't get many calls. What that means is that for, you know, that, that in a sense, I'm pretty much responsible each time we're on the air live for fulfilling two hours. And a lot of times I'm not really sure until we actually get into it and do it, how long the particular issues that I've prepared will take. On a couple of, several, not just a couple, I would say, you know, frequently, um, I go into a program at the beginning and I've, I've in a three or four minute chat before we go on the air with Agnes and Bob when Bob's here, um, I will often say I really don't know how today's program is going to go. I hope it goes all right. And part of the reason I say that is because I'm not really sure about the time. I'm not really sure whether I've got enough material to fill two hours until I actually do it. And I worry about that. I don't want to get, you know, within 15 or 20 minutes of the end of our program in the second hour and not have anything meaningful to say because I'm not going to just stand here and babble. If I don't have something to say that's worthwhile, I just as soon get off the air. So yesterday when I called Agnes uh, about not doing a live program, I introduced this idea. And so today I mentioned it. She, she and Bob were talking about it last night. Uh, and I told her that I really wanted to throw this idea out to the listeners, to you folks. And so that's really what I chose to open today's program with. And what I suggested to Agnes is the possibility of instead of doing a two hour program three days a week, I knew I couldn't do it five. I knew when I first began this, there was no way in the world that I could do a two hour program, live program five days a week. Um, that would be a 45 or 50 hour a week venture. And I, I, I just can't, I just can't afford to do that. And I don't think I could do it physically. So what I suggested to Agnes yesterday was the possibility of extending the program from three days a week through the full five days, Monday through Friday, but cutting back and doing one hour a day rather than two. And when you think about it, on Tuesdays, because of the Rotary meeting, it's cut back to an hour and a half. So what that means is that we're really live five and a half hours a week, two hours on Monday, two hours on Wednesday, and an hour and a half on Tuesdays. So that's a total of five and a half hours a week. What I'm proposing would be five hours a week. So the, the total broadcast time would not be that materially affected. But I think it would really make it quite a bit easier for me to do it that way. Because when we began the program four years, almost four years ago now, I really did anticipate that we would get, you know, a, that, that we would get a series of calls. And at the beginning, when we first started, I wasn't getting him, and Bob and I chatted about it. And both of us kind of concluded that the nature of what I was trying to do here at the Virtual Center really made it a little bit difficult to expect to get calls because they really weren't discussion topics so much as they were informational topics. And basically, what I was doing for a long time was delivering information. It was almost like putting together a two-hour lecture, college lecture, three days a week. That's 
pretty ambitious. And for a while I did it, but the th I thought that after we got beyond the first three or four months and got a lot of the information out there after we had been through Federalist Number 10 and and Federalist Number 9 and Federalist Number 51 and 39 and 68 and the major major ones we dealt with on the court, on representation, uh, uh, on the power of government and the efficiency and effectiveness of an aggressive government, Hamilton's argument, uh, uh, his very, very solid argument in Federalist Number 9 about the need for a strong government to put down internal dissent. I, I really thought that after we get through some of those basics, that we would be having general open discussions about things like the Electoral College and the Bill of Rights and the issue of free speech and religious freedom and freedom of the press and freedom of assembly and, 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 and the Heller decision on guns and those kinds of things. But in reality, while we've covered those, we haven't really had the discussions. Um, and, and so basically, um, what that has meant over the course of the time we've been on the air now, which is getting very close to four years, we're pretty much about nine. We're we're about three months short of four years. That I've pretty well gone into each program on the assumption that I'm probably not going to get any calls. I solicit them each day, but since we get so few, I've kind of made that a matter of routine. But the fact of the matter is, I go into the program with the assumption that I'm probably not going to hear from anybody while we're on the air. <clears throat> and then when Horse does call or when somebody else does call, and you remember we for a while we had Harry in Baltimore who was calling and we had a caller from Sweden and, of course, Horse calling from, from Taiwan and a number of other people. I know we have a, a, a regular listener who's on the road who drives a, uh, drives a semi all over the country and he calls from different places all over the country and we've heard from him. Uh, more than more than a couple of times. But generally speaking, those are more surprises than anything else because I really don't expect them. And so the fact of the matter is, when I put the program together, I'm assuming that I've got to put something together that really will fill two hours worth of airtime. Sometimes it's easy. If you're dealing with a document like Federalist Number 10 or Federalist Number 51 or, or a number of those, it's easy because the documents are so substantive that you could really go on for four, five and six hours on a particular document. I've done that. Some of these major documents, as you know, we've spent three, four programs, consecutive programs dealing with that one document. But then at other times, the issues aren't quite that substantive. They're more opinion than anything else. And they would really benefit from a, a, a kind of a discussion that involved just more than, more than one person, clearly, but even more than two, where we would have a kind of a roundtable discussion on particular issues. A couple of those I'm going to get into today, and I think, I think I'll be able to illustrate exactly what I mean. But those, you never really know how long they're going to go because the substantive information doesn't take that long to deliver. One of the issues that I want to deal with today is the so-called emoluments clause of the Constitution. I've kind of had it on my desk here for the last three or four live programs, and I haven't really done it yet. And in fact, one day last week, Bob suggested that we get into that because it was getting a lot of attention. And it's continuing to get a lot of attention because of uh, President-elect Trump's business interests, which really ex extend all over the world. And what that's, tr what that's liable to mean, not only in terms of foreign policy, but also especially in terms of conflict of interest. And so I'm going to deal with that but in, in, in a moment. But the fact of the matter is you can't spend, I can't spend by myself two hours on the emoluments clause because there's not that much to it. 
basically what I would need in order to really expand and mine the, emolu the emoluments clause for what's there and all it's worth. It would seem to me we would need a discussion that would involve a number of folks. And I go into the program assuming that we're probably not going to get those folks. So therefore, I don't really know at the front end of the program how long, how much time a particular issue is going to take. And uh, so when I'm putting a program together and, and things aren't coming together and I, I have this, that, and this, and that, and five or six different issues but they don't seem to be connected. They don't seem to relate. At least I'm not, you know, at that particular time. For me, they're not coming together. And I start to stress a little bit. And that's what happened yesterday. So, you know, again, it was my fault. But at the same time, it did prompt me into this discussion. So what I suggested to Agnes yesterday, and as I mentioned, she told me today that she and Bob had chatted about it. And it's indeed doable. Um, would be changing the format of the virtual center from two hours, three days a week to one hour, five days a week. And as somebody that spent, you know, more than 50 years in higher education, putting lectures, putting, you know, 50 minute lectures together, um, it seems to me after doing two hour programs for a while, the thought of doing one hour programs seems seems pretty, pretty attractive, very honestly. Um, but I really want to get your input on this. I mean, I really because this program is not for me, it's for you. And so I wanted to and I told Agnes today that even though she and Bob uh, think that it's it's doable and it might be a good idea. The fact of the matter is, it's the listeners that count. And I'd like to get your input on this. I mean, today would be great because we will be here for the full two hours. And, and I would, if I made this program, I would announce it ahead of time. I wouldn't just suddenly do it. Um, we would say, you know, beginning the 1st of December or the 1st of January or something like that. But... Um, That'll give that would give people an opportunity to to kind of think about it. And and if they did have something substantive they wanted to throw into the pot or get on the table or whatever, that would give them time to do it, either with an email, with a phone call uh, or indeed Facebook, because I'm all over Facebook. We have a Facebook page, which I look at every day and uh, we could we could do it that way. So again, I guess the question is what, you know, what do you think about the program? I think in terms of archiving the program, it would be easier. I think it would make the archives, the, the per program, one hour long archived programs more manageable. What I mean is that when they go on Facebook, we could just assign a topic to each one. And chances are most of the programs would be built around one or perhaps two issues, no more than that. And so what that would mean is it would give us a substantial amount of time to develop an issue. And then um, the time to develop another issue if that if that uh, situation arose or to develop the issue for the full met, full hour. Or whatever, but it seems to me it would make the the management of archiving the programs a little bit more meaningful because with the two hour programs, it's a little bit difficult to assign a title or a topic to a two hour program because sometimes they deal with four and five different issues over the two hours. And so I think what that means is much of what we've done gets and, and that we archive is lost. Because the only thing we've got to go on is the date of the broadcast. And even I can't remember by date what we dealt with, especially when you look back over almost four years of programs. 
So it seems to me that this would open the opportunity to have a greater range of topics. I've been thinking about going back and revisiting a number of topics that we haven't dealt with for a while. I mean, we spent an incredible amount of time on Federalist Number 10 early on in the program's history, as well as some of the Federalist Papers. We spent an incredible amount of time, well over a year ago, on the Declaration of Independence, um, on Gary Will's book, Inventing America, and his introduction of the Scottish Enlightenment into the Declaration of Independence story. We talked about John Locke, and we talked about the extent to which um, there has been concerted effort to associate Jefferson's declaration with, with the philosophy of John Locke and what that has meant, what it has caused us to overlook. It seems to me that a number of these topics really scream to be revisited because they're very important. They are the substance of what we're doing. And the fact of the matter is, there's all sorts of discussions that are going on all over the media. You can find them everywhere, panel discussions and the rest of them. But the fact of the matter is, there aren't all that many programs that present substantive information. And I really do believe that that's what we've got here at the virtual Bill? Hello? Which raised questions about the traditional issues. Bill? I think we might have a caller. We do. Can you hear me? I can hear you fine. Oh, okay. Yes, Horst's on the line. Oh, great. Horst. All right. Hello? Hold on one second, Bill. Okay. Sorry, sorry, I had my mic muted. You hear me now? Oh, I got you great. You sound Terrific. great. How are, how are you? I'm all right. I'm all right. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing well. Thank you. Yeah, good. It's good to hear from you today. I'm, Thank you. I appreciate I, I, that. I'm, I'm sorry to hear about your dilemma from yesterday, but I, I, I do oh, understand. Oh, it's, 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 it it's, it's a dilemma. It's a personal dilemma. Well, it's an ongoing it, thing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's a, but it's a dilemma. And, and you know, and right. part of it is the, is the length. I mean, there's absolutely no kidding. Um, that is, you know, for... For new information all the time, that's that's quite a bit. For sure. But yeah. uh, anyway, I, I'm kind of guessing when, when, since you called at this particular time that you've got uh, things to contribute to this. I'd love to hear them. Well, I just wanted to bounce a couple of things off of you because, as you were saying, um, you don't get a lot of participation from callers, um, and when you do, it tends to be people like me who, you know stick around <laughs> you know uh, but, that's okay uh, i'm glad you do <laughs> right well sure i get that but but uh, i i i think there are a couple of things that um that people uh, listeners not necessarily worry about but there are like factors that prevent them from calling in beyond okay. just just the uh the things that you've mentioned i think number one the time is is probably not very conducive to uh, because right. like uh, you're you're on like from one in the afternoon or or one thirty right to right. three, and most of the people who have you know an interest in this kind of subject are you know probably engaged uh, right in ways that they can't they absolutely they just don't have the ability to to listen live to listen right and right. if you can't listen live then you can't call in and that's I think that's yeah. number one from one to three yeah. that's a tough slot I mean like nobody's in their car everybody's at work or yeah. If you're like me, you're you should be in bed, and you're not. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are times when I think I should be in bed too, but I'm not. <laughs> well, not, not just yet. You hang on to it. <laughs> okay, but but I think that's but, that's a big factor right there. I think that's one of the main reasons why you you really most of your traffic is, so to speak, is is on on podcasts. On podcasts. I don't. I don't, yeah. I don't think. I think. I don't. I just don't see how many people have the ability to listen live uh, right. in those particular hours. And I think that's your major obstacle right there. That's great. That's a great point. 
that's a great point. And even though the time, uh, the time, uh, times are different depending on where you are. The fact that I mean, you know, that for you they're very different. But, but even within the continental United States, we've got a number of different time zones. Well, that's true. But I all suppose- of them are. But all of them are in the daytime. Right. I mean, even even the West Coast is nine o'clock. You know, it's ten o'clock in the morning. Yeah, it's still just a little bit too early. There, there's right. not a sweet spot for for what you're what you're broadcasting. No. I suppose, it's like uh, maybe in Central Time, you might there might be a couple of people there, that, like on Learn Lunch Break, that could listen to you, but not for two yeah. hours. No, uh, not for two hours. Right. Right. So right. I think that's, that's a big that, contributing that, factor. That's a good point. Well, I mean, you know, obviously that 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 opens the possibility of another time. Well, could uh, be, but you know, yeah. But on the other hand, uh, you know, it, you know, without without doing anything that drastic, the fact of the matter is, you, if you aim the program for the fact that that the bulk of the traffic is going to be podcast, then you can kind of present the program that way. Yeah, but, uh, I suppose that, so. But the th- you know, that, that's, that's the other thing. Is like I, I think the, in, in the particular time slot you've got, this is more again. Uh, it, it just just kind of feels more like a, a lecture and listening kind of a seminar sort of you know, right. time slot. I guarantee. I would. I would imagine. I'm not going to guarantee you. I was about to, but I'm not going to do that. But right. I would imagine that um, if you you broadcast in the evening, you would right. get people. Re- in a more relaxed, loosened, like, you know, I'm ready to have a, a conversation about these subjects, kind of a mood. You yeah. Know? Yeah. And, it, and there's not much you can do about that. There's there's absolutely really nothing you can do about that because um, all, all, all that, that, that real estate is already filled up, basically. And, right. <laughs> and that's just right. how it goes. Right. I know. I know. But uh, the other thing, and I've thought of is weekends, uh, um, you know, and, and you know, and – Late at night, I thought of programs that late at night, you know, uh, 11, 11 p.m. or something like that. Uh, I thought of perhaps uh, following Bob when he gets off the air uh, later, later in the evening or something like that. But, yeah. but again, I don't know that there's a, I don't know that there's an ideal because if there's an ideal, it's pretty much already filled. And uh, well, I suppose so. I mean, in in your particular niche of radio. Um, there's not exactly an ideal. It's just, I suppose. I, I guess you just kind of have to think of like who you're up against that that's already got a spot carved right. out there. Right, right, right. And, you know, and, and Bob has got good friends who broadcast. You know, in opposing time frames along with him, and you know, they all right. they all understand. It's like, well, you know, this is just when where the listeners are, and this is how it goes. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, you know. but that your your point is very very well taken, and and. Uh, uh, you know, over the over the months and, and years, actually, that we've been doing this, I, I've kind of recognized that that yeah. the amount of li- the number of live listeners is obviously limited. I understand that, and uh, because I I get emails from people who tell me that they're running two or three days behind the programs. They're listening to the podcast from three days ago or something like that, right. and and so that really eliminates the 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 option of spontaneous conversation. Pretty much, right? It, and, it does. And, uh, yeah, yeah. So I, th- I think that's a that's a very very good point. And not only that, though, I think you also make a valid point when you say that that, that people are just naturally reluctant to to um, interject uh, when um, they had. There's there's a sense that there there is some information that needs to be imparted here you know what i mean like i don't, I don't mean like to make it as, as formal a thing as like a lecture but at the same time this is very much a history oriented program so you, right. you kind of have a natural expectation when you listen that there's going to be a, a, a specific topic and a thesis and kind right. of expounding and, and like we're going to go through these points and these points and these points and i got I, I i have to tell you i'm not immune to this i mean i do feel like i'm interrupting you know when i call in uh, okay, but but I'm just naturally shameless, so I don't mind. Like uh, when, <laughs> when, once I get in, I'll, I'll hijack the whole damn thing, you know, until yeah. until the end of the show. And yeah. we, we've been through this, and I I don't I don't feel good about it, and I I kind of wonder, <laughs> you know, like what kind of reactions is this happening out there? Like I think it's, I think the it's great. 
Well, I, I know you great. do, but I, I don't know about the rest but, of the listeners. So but, I, I do. But I'll to, you. I wonder about that. But yeah, but but what I'm saying is like I if I have those trepidations, I do it anyway. I, I, I yeah. figure that, that most of the listeners out there is like, oh God, this is terrible, and they, they don't want to be right. that guy. They don't want to be that person that that, that calls in and does that. So I, I think there's, yeah. that's also a, another thing there. And there is, but the the large point is it, there does seem to be a theme. And if there's a theme ongoing, if if I don't have, a, if I can't come up with a thing, an idea to contribute to that particular theme, I don't want to derail the conversation. I understand. I understand. I, I, you know, you know, between you and me, I will do it anyway. But uh, but other people, I think, are going to be a, a bit more delicate about that, and I think right. that's just another, you know, right. Another well, I understand. Yeah, and I, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I wouldn't call. I mean, you know. I, I wouldn't call, and because I'm not, I, I'm I, I'm I'm not as bold as you, I guess. But I wouldn't I wouldn't do it, you know. And yeah. my feeling is, hell, I think what I got to say might be important, but it's probably not as important as that. So I, the hell with it. I'm just going to let it go, you know, and and not raise it. And everybody loses by that. But on the other hand, it's hard to it's hard to it's hard to tell people that, and you can't because you can't prove it. You know, you can't prove a negative. True. Uh, but uh, anyway, the, yeah, I think everything you've said is 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 right on. What what do you think about what do you think about our programs? Do you think that would be better? Would be worse? What? Well, I mean, uh, if if you want to go that way, I mean, I I'm, I'll always be a loyal listener. Uh, I, I I tend to tune in by podcast too myself. I mean, like sure. if I happen if I happen to be up and it happens to be the right day, uh, then I might. I might tune in live, but right, it would fit my schedule fine. But I'm not a typical listener in, in that no. sense. I mean, like um, I know, I know. I think an hour program. I mean, you know what? If I did not have any appreciation until you mentioned it this evening that that you had that much um, pressure attached to this, it, it it just didn't even occur to me. I mean, like I'm a, I'm a, I'm a teacher. You're a teacher. But in a very different kind of way, right? <laughs> you know, I'm I'm yeah. used to to standing up in a, in front of a class and just you know going on and on and 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 talking and just like trying to do whatever I can to to make connections to this and that. But it is uncomfortable. I don't like doing yeah. it. If, if, if you know, if there's if if there's not engagement, if there's not a back and forth, I do feel like at some point like I'm just droning and I don't uh, really yeah don't want to do enjoy that. that at all. Yeah, well, especially and, and with this particular audience, I know. That I can't get, I can't get away with. I mean, I can't get away with that indefinitely. I mean, maybe on, maybe on occasion, but not, not as a regular practice. I can't do it because people will pick up on. I can pick up on that in a second, and I don't want to do that. But at the same time, I do go into some programs with the idea. Well, I know this is going to take the bulk of the first hour, and then I've got this other issue that I want to get into. But I don't know if it's going to take a full hour. Yeah. Okay, but at the same time, I have to tell you, Doctor Bill, there are a couple. I, 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 you know, I've been listening to this program since the first, since the first episode. But like you said, like right. getting, getting on to four years now. Right. And there have been, there's been a handful of occasions when, when you've like, uh, you've had one program I thought was perfectly normal, and the next one you signed on, next one you're like, you know what? I feel so bad about Tuesday's program. I, I feel like I just mailed it in, like I wasn't even present for it, and I, I was listening to that thing to myself. What are you talking about? <laughs> you know, yeah. Like I, yeah. I thought it was, I thought it was excellent. I thought I got a lot yeah. of information from it, and and you for for whatever you know by your own personal uh, rubric failed to meet whatever expectations you have, and you know right. you got at the same time, you have to you have to realize that, that that you're not always the best judge of your own performance and, and, right. and certain things like that. So, right. And there, this, there's been multiple occasions of this. I mean, like you have to go back, you have to comb through like years of archives to to find like even a handful of examples. But you've done this a couple of times. You've said like, if I, if I could go back and just delete that episode, I would have done it. And I would have done it. Yeah. 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 And, and, I, and then the irony is, I've had people, I've had people tell me that my brother, for example, is right. is a rather regular listener, and he listens live. I mean, he doesn't listen to podcast at all. Right. And. And he's on a couple of occasions. He's told me about programs, but usually he won't mention it. He'll say, "I heard the program today. I liked it," or something. And that's all there is. But then occasionally he'll say, "You know, that particular program, the program you did today was really. I didn't know any of that stuff." Right. And I'm thinking, and that's one of the programs I felt like I mailed in. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know no, that. Sure. I, it, 
and, you know, well, and, and uh, because it's just inf- it's pure information It's not really I'm not I'm, I don't feel like I'm doing anything with it other no. than presenting it. Well, you're probably you know? driven by what they call an internal register. You, you listen to yourself deliver uh, a conversation and you're judging yourself by what you would personally be interested in. But you have to you have to realize that you know so much more. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not trying to be flattering or anything like that. But, but, no. but you, you, this is your area of expertise and you have a lot of knowledge to impart. And a lot of that is stuff that you think is just obvious that right. everybody and knows. Because and and they you've don't. been, you've and been they dealing don't. with it for 30, 40, 50 years. I mean, and, and right. those of us out here is like, what? I never heard that in my life. Just like your yeah. brother says, like, I never heard any of this stuff. No, exactly. Uh, yeah, you could, you know, metaphorically speaking, you know, you, you could, you could uh, sort through the, the sofa cushions and pull out loose change, and, and, and yeah. you know, and, and yeah. we would be astonished at, at some of the stuff that you have out there. So, you know, yeah. I would be. I would advise you to t- kind of take it easy on yourself if you're really feeling stressed about, um, yeah, yeah, your presentations and stuff like well, that. Well, the point I've, is, that I've I, never heard a bad broadcast, not even once. What, uh, so. what I what I feel, and I'll, I'll be, I'll share this because no, I've never been in this conversation with anybody before, other than my wife. But, um, you know, one of the things that I particularly and I mean, the fact that I do these programs and the fact that I that it keeps me reading and keeps me thinking and keeps me researching is so important to me that I mean, personally, I mean, I get that's what I get out of this, because I when I put together a program that I feel really good about and I think, man, that now that's one. If I didn't have that program, I never would have done that, you know, and I wouldn't have known it. And the people who were listening never would have known it. And. And that whole thing would have just gone right by the boards. And 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 I and I really really feel good about those particular days. But then on other days, you're right. Many of the things that I deal with, sometimes I feel like these are things that I've always done and I've always known. I mean, I, the, my bro, for example, with my brother, I was often say, "Hell, you could have asked me years ago. I'd have told you that." You know. But <laughs> but um, but the fact of the matter is. Um, you know that the, the some of these things seem to me rather routine, and and I, you tend to assume that everybody else already knows them, and right. they don't. And I I, pre- I appreciate that. I I, well, I do appreciate that. And to put another another spin on that, what what you've said there is uh, a lot of where we find ourselves in the political disaster we are right now is I think in no small part related to an assumption that everybody knows what we know and is up to speed on things that we think are obvious and and we take for granted right Um, right and so uh, maybe if 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 a bit of your program needs to be what you would consider kind of remedial that might not be such a bad idea i I got you we got to give everybody a hand up and i'm one of those people you know american history is not something i studied overtly in, in in school i've learned a ton right (laughs) <laughs> you know, even on those those uh, episodes that you thought you you just mailed it in, I was I was like your brother. I'm like, wow, you know what? I I learned something. Well, I'll tell you what what stuff. I think back what I think back on, and I, in fact, I did this over the weekend. I thought about this. Um, the Confederation period, the Articles of Confederation period, and and. Um, you know what what essentially the issues were surrounding independence and and all of those things i mean it's been a while since we've dealt with that stuff and that really is important i mean because I don't know if that you, we ever really got deeply into it in the first place i mean like you we you've dealt with the periphery of, of those things and you mentioned right. uh, uh your own mentors uh, uh yeah Merrick Garland? Gar- no, Gar- yeah, not Garland. Jensen. Jesus. Jensen. <laughs> Merrill <laughs> Jensen, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With the, the Supreme Court nominee. All right. Merrill right. Jensen, yeah. I've, I've looked up his book. I've, been, I've tried to, to, to purchase it a couple of times here, but it's uh, I can only get the paper-bound copy, and it's it's very right. expensive to get shipped out. But right. I'm, I'm, you, you piqued my curiosity on more than one occasion. <laughs> but yeah. you've never really gone deeply into that, like the, the arguments that, that go in. Yeah. And this is one of those things – I have had like a, a deep and abiding conflict on a, on a, a handful of points listening to the program over the last three or four years. And one of them is, you know, and listening to John Kaminsky and 
talking about how you know the whole transition from the articles to the constitution was a, a bit of a forced uh, or an artificial you know crisis in the first place and it's it feels like we're reaching or we're approaching it like a bifurcation point like that in our own history right now exactly uh, we I mean, are and there seems to be <clears throat> a pattern in history that might might be repeating itself i don't know i i you know just there, there's these things I've never really been very clear about whether it was a good thing <laughs> to to, uh -huh. to stop the articles and and proceed into the con the uh, the constitutional era, um, and that brings into whole into question a, a lot of considerations about states' rights versus you know yeah exactly it does the other things and uh -huh. I have my own sense that. I am more concerned these days with issues of equal protection. I think I I would much rather have equal protection for citizens of of the U.S. in you know in favor rather than <clears throat> worrying about states' rights and deciding who gets to have enjoy what kind of privileges and who don't. But right, that's just a that's a gut reaction. I don't really mm -hmm. have a very solid intellectual basis for any of that. So, right. Moving forward, that might be something to, 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 to think about. I don't know. that I yeah. would appreciate that. And I yeah. might be some people. Well, I mean, that. there were a number of those areas. When, when I first, I mean, these were the really, these were the priority topical areas that I dealt with at the beginning. But the fact of the matter is, and that was three and a half years ago. And, and they are, the, and, and they are worth revisiting because they really are critical to a lot of this stuff. And as you say, we're going through this issue again, this issue of states' rights um, uh, right now and, and, you know, and, and who controls the states and, 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 and to what extent that's a real consideration, to what extent it's a cover for a seizure of power. Those kinds of questions are critical, and they were at the time of, the, of independence itself. Yeah, it's and, just and a, that, it, it, and in that this particular era, yeah, it, it seems like yeah. the, the whole state rights thing is, is more of a divide and conquer strategy than it is anything to do oh, with yeah. you know, individual you know, laboratories of democracy or whatever they want to call it. No, exa um, exactly. It's not. You're right. It, it, it's, and it's exactly that. And that was the thing. I remember when I went to graduate school, that was the thing that I got from Jensen that was totally new to me. I had never even thought not, it never even crossed my mind that this kind of stuff would be going on. And he, he would raise questions about um, you know, why, why would an attorney like John Adams, for example, um, become a supporter of independence when the educated knew that revolutions were very dangerous? Because once you take the genie out of that bottle, how do you get it back in? Right. You know, and, and, and all of these questions and John Adams is a lawyer and, and, um, uh, George Washington was an aristocrat and, so why would these people risk independence and, you know, what all was involved in the thing? And, of course, the fact of the matter is it was a transfer. It was a different set of power brokers. And that really was what it was about. And, you know, it's 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 you're right. These are critically important issues. And I think we're going into them again. In fact, and you mentioned the political crisis that we're in now. Yeah. And that that I'm that's working on me. Because I'm beginning to see a lot of the things that I've always cared passionately about rapidly descending into the never, no chance in hell. <laughs> Is this ever going to happen, you know? Yeah, including and, a handful of things that we thought were kind of, you know, taken care of by this point. Like, okay, we can cross that one off the list. No, you can't. <laughs> no, you can't. No, we, I mean, we're, we're back at the very beginning here. I mean, oh, when uh, this morning, I mean, uh, you know, uh, Trump. Tweet, tweeting over the weekend about putting people in jail for a year for burning the flag. Right. And I'm thinking, oh, Jesus, because that, I mean, that's a, that's a hot issue with a lot of people. Right. There were a lot of people HHS, out there. That, uh, the guy who's, who's already announcing a plan for rolling back Medicare, like starting in eight months or something like that. Yeah. I mean, like, what in, what in the earth? I mean, it's like uh, we have... Next thing you know, they're going to have a plan to, to get us back in the trees and the caves in two years. That's, that's right. That's right. And I, I heard earlier today uh, on a talk program, Hugh Hewitt, um, 
who's, you know, he's extremely conservative, very articulate, but very conservative. Anyway, he was saying that this this Tom is a Tom Clark, this guy that that, that they're kind of saying is going to be head of H uh, Health and Human Services. Uh, right. Yeah. He's a physician. And, mm. you know, and and he said absolutely perfect person for this perfect person he cares about all the right things he's got all the right set of priorities he cares about patients he cares about people he cares about dollars he cares about debt he cares about inflation he's the absolutely perfect person to manage this whole process of dismantling obamacare and i'm thinking god almighty i mean it's taken years to get health care to the people that we that have it now and we're going to take it away I mean, yeah, on, on the God. premise that it, that it wasn't good enough. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, we, yeah, yeah. We we all agreed that it wasn't good enough, but you know. Yeah. But, yeah, well. yeah. Oh my, I agree. But anyway, Horst, I, 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 the the things that you've said and the contributions you've made to this are really, really valuable because uh, I, I really do believe that this that this is a you know that the the issues you raise are very, very important. No, yeah, I just wanted to give you like a little bit of uh, additional perspective on that. Uh, there, it's not as futile an enterprise as it might seem sometimes. <laughs> I mean, like if you don't get the interaction, I think mostly, I think mostly that ha that is due to just, you know, what time the program is on, and you know, there's yeah. just not a lot you can do about that. Uh, but also the nature of it, like you and Bob have discussed, it really does kind of have a feel of more of a top-down exercise of knowledge coming down to you. Yeah, yeah. And I think a lot of people are just naturally reluctant to, to, to interrupt that, to break into it. Right, uh, right. I understand. Well, I can, I mean, in class, for example, and I've taught for a number of years. I was a student for a number of years. And yeah. I felt that way as a student. I was very reluctant to re ask questions in class because I always felt like my question was going to change the subject in the middle, in midstream, and then the person teaching wouldn't be able to get back to his train of thought or her train of thought or whatever. And yeah. then I was screwing up the whole thing, you know? Oh, well, I deal and, with it in an entirely different way. I, 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 I teach uh, probably the most naturally shy students you'll ever meet in your life. Taiwanese students do not want to answer any questions. I, uh, every day, I spend three hours a day in class <laughs> like asking a question. Nobody wants to volunteer anything because nobody wants to be the center of attention. They just can't stand right. it. So yeah, uh -huh. I, I, I get that too. But it's, yeah. it, it's a different kind of thing, but I know the yeah. feeling. That's what I'm saying. I feel your yeah. pain. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, listen, thank you anyway, so much. Anyway, I'll let you get back to it, but, but yeah. All right, buddy. Uh, listen, listen thank you. And, and, yeah. Thank you okay. very much. Okay. 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 Next time. All right, thank you, thank you, Horst. Thanks a million. Um, wonderful, wonderful uh, call. Uh, some of the some of the things that he mentioned are are so pertinent and so important. I know Agnes is there in the studios listening. I'm hoping so, because um, I think a, a number of things he said are issues that we would all have to sit down together and talk about uh, in terms of the time of day and the day of the week and all these other things and. Uh, you know what we what we're about and what we're trying to do, and because we're not in a position, obviously, here in the Head On Radio Network, where you know where, where we can compete for audience. I mean, you can't compete with some of these big conglomerate type operations that are functioning. I listen to a number of these things on on terrestrial radio, for example, and you can't compete with these people because there's so much money behind them. Um, that they stay on even if there's nobody listening. But the fact of the matter is there there are people listening to that, and we know it. Um, but again, there's so many so many issues involved here, but it's important, and I just wanted uh, everybody to to know where where I'm coming from because uh, I, I did did so appreciate the things that Horst said, and and some of them, you know, obviously were very very complimentary, and I appreciate that personally. Um, but the fact of the matter is there are a couple of programs that I, I mean, not not just a couple, probably more than that, uh, programs over the years that I can think back on that I feel like, you know, I really I really like to have that one back, you know, at the, and, and part of it is me. I mean, I'm not not part of it. Most of it. The information doesn't change my ability to present it in a way which I feel comfortable with is is the issue one of the things that i've thought about in in uh uh in this possibility of going back to a one-hour format for example 
is if we if we're talking about a particular document, like one of the documents that I've got in mind uh, that I think we we really need to return to, even though um, I said we wouldn't, uh, is Federalist Number Sixty Eight on the Electoral College. And I really felt last week like we pretty well put the in the, the Electoral College to bed, tucked her in, and and that ought to be it for a while. The fact of the matter is the Electoral College is not going away as an important issue in today's world. I'm reading things still <coughs> about what's happening as a result of this election. And the fact that there are a number of people, electors, from particular states who have openly acknowledged that they fully intend to vote in opposition to the way the citizens of their states voted. A number of them, one of them, for example, I read about, is in a state where I think there were 20, I'm guessing, 22 states, maybe 23 states, something like that, that have passed legislation requiring electors to go along with the voters. In other words, if you are chosen as an elector in that one of those states, you do not have the option of voting your conscience. You are required to cast your vote in accordance with what the people, the voters of your state, said on election day. If they voted for Donald Trump, then you as an elector are committed to voting for Donald Trump. One of these electors said that he can't do that. And so therefore, he would probably resign and let them put an elector in my place who is comfortable casting a ballot for Donald Trump because I can't do that philosophically, morally, whatever. But there are electors from states that do not have laws in their states which require, and this is an important point, which Horst was talking about the fact that there are so many people, uh, there are people who didn't know some of these very basic pieces of information. One of my best friends, and in fact, I think I mentioned this last week, who uh, I had breakfast with a couple of weeks ago. And he asked me a specific question about the Electoral College. And specifically, the question was, are the electors required to vote in accordance with the will of the voters in their state? And my response was no. The electors, according to the way the Constitution is written, the electors are chosen for their ability and their judgment, their, their wisdom and their ability to make independent judgments and decisions in the best interests of the citizens of their state. And if they believe in their own hearts that the voters made a mistake and that the state would be better off with somebody else as president of the United States, then the Constitution gives them the opportunity to do that. The only places that that doesn't work are in those states, and there are more than 20 of them, I, I, think, I think 22, but I'm not sure, which have passed laws requiring electors to go along with the vote of the majority of people in their state. And what we have with the two-party system, of course, is we have a slate of Republican electors and a slate of Democratic electors. And depending on which candidate wins that state in the popular vote, that's the slate of electors that get the opportunity to cast a ballot for president. So, for example, here in West Virginia, Donald Trump won the state hands down. That means that when the Electoral College, when the electors come together in West Virginia to vote for the president, it is the Republican slate of electors who will do that. But West Virginia is not one of those states with a state law requiring that they do that. So that means that even though these people 
are Republican electors, so to speak, speak, they are still free to vote their conscience. There's nothing requiring them to cast the ballot for Donald Trump. Of course, if they don't, they won't be selected as an elector ever again. They're liable to be drummed out of their own party. But many of them are to, to many of them this that's well worth that it's well worth it. Uh, so basically that's what we're that's what we're dealing with. The Electoral College, especially as Hillary Clinton's popular vote margin continues to increase, and now it's well in excess of two million. The sentiment throughout the country to do away with the Electoral College because now it's way out of whack with the majority vote. When you get up over two million, that's a significant gap between what the Electoral College judge says is should be our president and what the people in the popular vote have said. So a lot of people who never before even thought about it are now feeling very strongly that we really ought to get rid of the Electoral College. So the point is, it doesn't really go away. It's still getting attention. Now, as we know, through the principally the efforts of Jill Stein, the Green Party candidate, who, and the, the, who's been responsible for raising more than $6 million to conduct, conduct recounts, in three northern uh, Midwestern states, Michigan, Wisconsin, and well, Pennsylvania, um, with the with the recounts in the offering, it's not allowing the electoral college as an issue to disappear. I don't think that this recount's going to go anywhere. In fact, some folks. At lunch today, we're making the point, think of what you could do for $6 million in terms of poor children and hungry children and, and, and all the rest of it. And what a waste of time it is to spend $6 million conducting a recount when even the people that are conducting it are admitting that there really isn't hard and fast evidence that there was any fraud going on during the, during the elections. So the fact of the matter is, it's going on. And as long as it's going on, and as long as the freedom of electors to not go along with the will of the majority of voters in this state exists, then the election remains open until it's not open anymore, which is sometime in December, when the states meet all the electoral votes from the different states are transmitted to this U.S. Senate in Washington. And then the Senate officially declares that Donald Trump will be elected president of the United States. At least that's my that's my presumption. I would be quite surprised if that doesn't indeed happen. Fact of the matter is, given what we've seen from Donald Trump's most avid supporters, If the recount effort or the action of actions of wayward electors were to deny Donald Trump the election at this, the 11th hour of the process, I don't think that Donald Trump or his supporters would be willing to accept the results at all. I think we would have a constitutional crisis unlike any we've ever had in the country since the Civil War. That's, that's my feeling. So at this point, even those who are most opposed to Donald Trump being president have to really deal with the reality that at this point in the process to deny him the election would probably create a crisis of unimaginable proportions in this country. And I don't think any of us want that. So anyway, that's kind of where we are. That takes us back to 68. 
to Alexander Hamilton's treatment of the Electoral College, how it came into being, why it reads as it does, and what its advantages are. And when I, what I started to mention earlier was, if we were doing a one-hour program rather than a two-hour program, then what I could envision would be announcing ahead of time that on tomorrow's program, we'll be dealing with Federalist number 68. So I'm going to post Federalist number 68 on our Facebook page so that everybody will have a chance to look at it before we go on the air tomorrow. Everybody will have a chance to bring it up while we are discussing it on the air. And that would mean that as we look at the language of Federalist number 68, we'd be looking at it together. And that would mean that all of us would get a much, would get much more out of it. It's not the best form for me to read extensive paragraphs of a document on the air in audio. And then to, and then to launch into a discussion of the ingredients of that particular paragraph. It would be much more effective if people had these particular paragraphs right in front of them as we talked about them. And if people had some warning as to what documents we would be addressing in time to give them a look before we went on the air. Federalist number 68, the mode of electing the president was was one of the later Federalist Papers. It's number 68 out of 85. It appeared in the New York newspapers, the New York Packet, on the 14th day of March, 1788. So the Federalist Papers began to appear in the New York newspapers in October of 1787. This one is March 14th of 1788. So clearly, it's one of the latest ones. First thing that I think we need to, and I think I may have mentioned this before, Alexander Hamilton tells us that the one feature of the Electoral College as part of the Constitution that makes it unique is that it's the one element within the Constitution that doesn't seem to have generated any opposition. Most people at that time supported what was in the Constitution about the Electoral College. Or if they didn't, they really hadn't been able to articulate a counter argument. And so as Alexander Hamilton says at the opening of number 68, The introduction of the Electoral College in the process of choosing the chief executive really is unique when it comes to the Constitution because it's one of the few sections that really hasn't generated any opposition. He says, quote, that this mode of appointment of the chief magistrate of the United States is almost the only part of the system of any consequence which has escaped without severe censure or which has received the slightest mark of approbation from its opponents. Even the opponents of the Constitution haven't said anything negative about the Electoral College. Now, you can either interpret that to mean that they support it or you can interpret it to mean that if they don't support it, they really don't have another alternative. In other words, that they don't feel that strongly about it one way or the other. There's nothing in it that really gets them upset. The most plausible of these, he says, who has appeared in print, has even deigned to admit that the election of the president is pretty well guarded. In other words, 
we've pretty well done our job protecting the integrity of choosing the president. Even the opponents of the Constitution admit that in this particular section, the Electoral College, they're pretty satisfied with what they see in the Constitution. Hamilton says, I venture somewhat further and hesitate not to affirm that if the manner of it be not perfect, it's at least excellent. It unites in an eminent degree all the advantages, the union of which has to, was to be wished for. In other things, in other words, even if it's not perfect, it's pretty darn good because it touches on, it covers most of the advantages that any of us could hope for. And if you remember, when we first started to talk about the Electoral College, we made the point that the Electoral College is one of the more confusing, complex parts of the Constitution because it really doesn't have an intent. It doesn't have a theme other than protecting the integrity of the process of choosing the president. But it has most of the advantages that any of us could have wished for. Then he goes into details on what some of those advantages are. He says, it was desirable that the sense of the people should operate in the choice of the person to whom so important a trust was to be, conf was to be confided. Translation, a number one priority, a first priority was that the people be involved in the choice of the president. We did that. This end, he says, will be answered by committing the right of making it, not to any pre-established body, but to men chosen by the people for the special purpose and at this particular juncture. What the Electoral College dictates or mandates is that the people chosen to be electors don't hold any other office. They can't hold any other office. They can't be a member of Congress or the Senate or they can't be on the court. They have to be citizens who were elected by the people for this one particular function and only this function. And after that function is carried out, the Electoral College disintegrates. It disappears. It's gone. These are people who are chosen only to do this and nothing else. It's equally desirable, Hamilton says, that the immediate election should be made by men most capable of analyzing the qualities adapted to the station and acting under circumstances favorable to deliberation and to a judicious combination of all the reasons and inducements which were proper to govern their choice. Not only are these people chosen only for this job, but it's important also that the people we pick to do it are the right people, are qualified people, people who know the qualities that they're looking for in a president. In other words, these are well-known, prominent, well-thought-of people in their communities. They are people best able to make this kind of a decision. And so they elected for that one purpose and that one purpose only. And in that sense, the system is pretty darn good. Hamilton says it was also particularly desirable 
to afford as little opportunity as possible for tumult or disorder. In other countries of the world, when they're choosing a president or a king or whatever, it oftentimes leads to violence, to disorder, to dissent. It was our desire that that not happen, that this be a regular, smooth process not characterized by tumult or disorder. This evil, he says, was not least to be dreaded in the election of a magistrate who was to have so important an agency in the administration of the government as the president of the United States. We're picking the chief executive of this nation. If there's one position that could cause trouble, it's this one. The fact that we were able to come up with a way to involve the people in this process without the risk of violence and dissent in the process meets with the approval of almost everybody. Hamilton says, but the precautions which have been so happily concerted in the system under consideration promise an effectual security against this mischief. We've been able to pull it off. We got the right people making the one and only decision they're going to make, and we've been able to do it in a way which is relatively free of turmoil. And as the electors chosen in each state are to assemble and vote in the state in which they are chosen, this detached and divided situation will expose them must let much less to heats and ferments, which might be communicated from them to the people if they were all to be convened at one time and in one place. In other words, one of the reasons that this has been able to, we were able to do this without turmoil, without trouble, was that the process is so divided. Each state has its own process where its own electors come together. If all people were to assemble in Washington, for example, at once, that would be a situation tailor-made for trouble. But the fact that this one is so divided, it's spread out amongst all the different states, that tends to make it tumult-free, dissent-free, turmoil-free. Nothing. Hamilton says, was more to be desired than that every practicable obstacle should be opposed to cabal, intrigue, and corruption. The one major priority was that we do this smoothly without trouble with general acceptance, and we've been able to do it. How could they better gratify this than by raising a creature of their own to the chief magistracy of the union. But the convention have guarded against all dangers with the most provident and judicious attention. They have not made the appointment of the president to depend on any pre-existing bodies of men who might be tampered with beforehand to prostitute their votes. But they, were, they, but they have referred it in the first instance, to an immediate act of the people of America to be exerted in the choice of persons for the temporary and sole purpose of making the appointment. We have pulled off the a miracle. We've pulled off the impossible. We've given the choice to the people, but we've done it in a way which is free of disorder free of tumult, free of 
any kind of intrigue. It's automatic. It's fast. It's painless. It's acceptable. It works. And the vast majority of people, even opponents of the Constitution, haven't been able to find anything wrong with the way we've been doing it. No senator, representative, or other person holding a place of trust or profit under the United States can be among the numbers of electors. Thus, without corrupting the body of the people, the immediate agents in the election will at least enter upon the task free from any sinister bias. The business of corruption, when it is to embrace so considerable a number of men, requires time as well as means. We gave them neither. So what Hamilton is doing in Federalist Number 68 is ticking off advantage after advantage after advantage of the way that the Electoral College is worded, the way it's structured in the Constitution. It's confusing, it's long, it's complex, but every item in it is designed to accomplish a particular thing or prevent, prevent a particular problem or issue from surfacing. The vice president, he says, is to be chosen in the same manner with one difference and that at the Senate is to do it rather than the House of Representatives if there's a crisis if there's no decision, firm decision to be made. But that's it. That's the Electoral College. That's why it's worded that way. So in essence, it doesn't really have an intent. It doesn't have a purpose or such a thing as the will of the founders, so to speak. We're kind of moving towards the end of our program today. We've got about two minutes left before we have to get off the air. We're just approaching 58 minutes after the hour. So I think it's time to wind this up and thank everybody for tuning in today. But most important, thank you for tuning in today. Because I think the issue we talked about in terms of involving people, listeners, in decisions we are contemplating making about the program will be and continue to be very significant. I appreciate Horst calling. I know that there are other people who have feelings as well. We will be here tomorrow for our regular two-hour program. We will address some of these issues tomorrow. The one thing I want to get to at the beginning of tomorrow's program is the issue of the emoluments clause, because I think it's getting a lot of attention. And that, of course, raises the issue of potential conflicts of interest because of Donald Trump's worldwide business interests. We'll deal with this tomorrow. But in the meantime, if you have any thoughts or ideas about some of the things we talked about about changes in our program or changes in our format here at the Virtual Center. I invite you, I beg you to share them with us. Drop me an email at waobrian906 at gmail.com or plan to call in tomorrow or post something on our Facebook page, on Facebook or whatever. But get your thoughts in the hopper because this is not something we would do lightly it's not th something that we'll do all of a sudden. We will give you plenty of warning when the program, when and if the program is about to experience a significant change. Again, thank you so very much for listening today. I hope you have a great day. In this area, it's an absolutely beautiful day. I hope yours is beautiful as well. Thank you so very much for listening. Have a good one. Be kind to each other and thank you.